Well, welcome back, everybody. We're excited to get into the next session. This is the Best Agile Articles of um, 2018 conference, and we have conference um, speakers who had articles represented in our book, uh, the 2018 year. And we have with us today, Kurt Nielsen, who I'm going to let um, introduce himself um, better than I can. And he's going to be talking about this topic, the fatal attraction of classic hierarchies. And just a few reminders, uh, you are all on mute, but you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. And we also have the chat box going, so feel free to drop any comments or questions in the chat box as we go along. So Kurt, with that, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me all right and everything is working techno technology wise and um, happy to see a, 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 a great crowd here. But uh, just uh, just a couple of things, just figuring out how we're going to do this. Um, I would be happy to answer questions as we go along. Uh, and uh, if you could do me the, the favor of, uh, of just turning on your video and holding up your hand in front of the camera or something so because um otherwise i i don't know who's who's there and who's talking and uh, there are two hands already yeah okay but you, you don't have to turn them on now uh, uh if you are uh, doing private things and of course that's your prerogative. but if you want to say something then that that would be helpful and Jerry, maybe you keep an eye out if I'm not observant enough and get caught up in the heat of the moment, then uh, give me a holler and I will uh, make a pause for so everyone. So um, with all that, let us just uh, look a little bit at the topic of today. Uh, the original article was called The Attraction of Classic Hierarchies. And so we've sort of sharpened it up a bit and called it The Fatal Attraction now. So um, obviously it has some connotation to um, to, to um, a well-known movie that we will just briefly touch on. But uh, I'm here to try and uh, give you an idea of a way where you could replace a dysfunctional hierarchy with, with a better paradigm. Um, my name is uh, Kurt Nielsen. I'm from Denmark, speaking from Denmark now, my home office, where we also have been locked up COVID-wise for a while. Um, I'm a certified scrum trainer, has been since 2008. Uh, done a lot of training and coaching, uh, also f in a in a in a lot of small setups. So I've had I've held an awful lot of trainings, uh, compared with the number of people that I've actually trained. But I've had the luxury of being on the inside of the organizational firewall in a lot of companies, uh, mostly of course on our home turf here in Scandinavia, but also Central Europe, Mexico the US and um, as far as way as Australia. Um, and so some of the things that have led to, to this series of discussions here, um, all these experience. Some of you are probably old enough to remember the 1987 film, Fatal Attraction with Michael Douglas and Glenn Close. And, um, and, and of course, this is a very sinister movie. Uh, an attraction that develops into something that completely overwhelms ordinary life and rationality. Now, my claim is today, of course, putting it a bit on the edge, but that there is a fatal attraction for us with the power hierarchy in, in our Western business society. Um, the media, and as late as today, the media I follow here locally, there is a great story about um, the, the heroic leader that is uh, the one that is on the top and has all the power. And although we pride ourselves of being an egalitarian society with one of the lowest power distances in the world, we still revere the imperial leader. And it's because it is coupled with power, status and money, it becomes the shiny object of desire. We must have it. We must move into that. I'm an old engineer, and I, I was not terribly old before. I was told, what? You're still doing engineering at your age? You should have moved into management. What's wrong with you? And um, it locks our mind into some categories of superiors and inferiors that I think is deeply unhelpful for creating value out of whatever we do. 
And that's what we're about. Our company, Agile Lean House, has as its vision to help people get more value out of their efforts, quite simply. And what, the way we do it is we train, we coach, and we make tools to help them get more value. And we'll try to show you a slightly better way forward. Now, the challenges for organizations, there's lots of different ways of, um, of um, describing that. And uh, this is, of course, just one of them. And um, uh, right now, I'm working uh, with investors and trying to get people in. Um, and, and, and they, of course, say, OK, what's your plan? Tell me what your plan. Oh, there it is, out there. Go. Just uh, get your act together and get out there. How hard can it be? Uh, the bank will tell you the same, and uh, sometimes uh, your board will tell you the same. And, uh, in reality, of course, uh, you may know that this is actually how it looks. Or you may not know, but you have experience from before that it might look like this. And the poor guy on the bike here has no idea whatsoever that there is a boat right in between whatever he, he has to do. Now, if, if this is what the world is like, and my claim is that it, very much so, actually. A lot of people interpret the world as being nice, simple, and orderly. Make a plan, get your act together, and get out there. And we are dealing with complexity all the time. That, that is the big challenge. And, that, and, and um, we simply, as human beings, do not have as much control as we would like to think. There's a lot of reason for that. Some of it is techn technological. Constantly, we're being shoved around by big technology giants doing something else than we thought they would, and new things, and globalization, consolidation, and constantly, we are hit by the unknown. So we have a lot of things to do, but we're in the complex domain where we only have fragmented knowledge, like we have bits and pieces of the puzzle and we still expect it to tell our customers and so on what's on the picture but we only have some pieces and that just requires people to engage in a totally different way not just executing tasks but we are uh, we have to get everybody's brain engaged to come up with an assessment of the situation making sense of the complex world and coming up with new solutions, innovation. But we don't have that engagement, not very often at least. You can find, you can find different numbers with this, but according to Gallup, um, about 85%, and this is US numbers, are, are disengaged. So they're, they're not engaged at work. 18% roughly about of these are actively disengaged. That means, they hang around with the coffee machine and the coffee cooler, uh, the, the, the water cooler, and spread uh, sort of messages contrary to where actually the organization wants to go. They are actively disengaged. Why are we disengaged? Another scary number is that, again, these are US numbers, but I don't think they're different here, not, not better at least. 50 to 70% of efforts in large projects are largely wasted because. Whatever is done actually doesn't com contribute to the value seen from the customer side. Wonderful things are being made, but the customer didn't want it really, so he doesn't use it. And why is that? Number one, good old fashioned misunderstanding of specs. You just didn't communicate. Something else was built than the customer thought he asked for. Number two, no real user wanted this stuff. Somebody thought it was good for the user. It might have been the boss or a salesperson, a developer or a consultant, but not the user. So he doesn't use it. And the third one is the world has changed and um, nobody discovered it because they didn't talk about it. So scary big number of resources, time wasted on stuff that doesn't produce value. And another number is which actually surprises me, it's not bigger, but this is the number that you can find that, again, US numbers, about 15% of the, of the total economy is wasted on useless bureaucracy. Uh, simply shifting stuff around, uh, papers and emails and uh, what have you, and meetings, and they don't contribute to anything. Um, so um, th th these are all scary big numbers. So the, our current management is broken and we need a new model. Uh, to, to live in this day and age of complexity. Uh, if we are going to be able to tackle the huge 
challenges of our generation well actually the generations to come and um and and we, we're just in the middle of it in, uh, with, with the COVID crisis. And of course, this has actually highlighted it and accentuated it that, that we all of a sudden, a lot of people say, well, well maybe, maybe we are not as much in control as we would like to think. But we have the whole climate situation. We have all sorts of other things. We have the, the, the rampant inequality um, in the world that uh, threatens, for example, in our part of the world uh, with... Um, a huge number of people coming from uh, poor areas and flooding our societies. How are we going to deal with all this? And we need to get back to a new way of, of, um, of managing. And actually it's an old way because we have to rediscover some of the values that we found in lean 50, 60 years ago, customer focus, removing of waste and respect for people. In our neck of the woods, when people have introduced lean, they have largely forgotten the last part of that sentence. It, they only saw it as an exercise in efficiency and cutting costs, but they forgot that the original lean, the Toyota production system, what the Japanese did um, in the, from the 50s to the 70s, was really geared around respect for people. We need to involve people. They need to have intrinsic motivation, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And we need to change the concept of, th of authority from a hierarchical point of view to push it as far out in the organization as we can find someone who can carry it. Um, there are several people, you can learn it from the military, from the Navy, uh, Stanley McChrystal, general in the US uh, Army, talks about his engagement in um, in, in Iraq, team of teams, where he discovered that. David Marquette, uh, American uh, submarine commander, has his book, Turn the Ship Around, where he, he uses this very sentence here, push the authority as far out as you can find someone who can carry it. And then people will engage if they have, they have the authority. One of our heroes in all of this, and, and what I consider to be the great grandfather of Agile and is W. Edward Stemming, famous American. Um, and he said long time ago, we must preserve the power of intrinsic motivation, dignity, cooperation, curiosity, joy in learning that people are born with. And I can fully subscribe to that. Now, given that, so what is it that, that, fa that fails today? So there's a Ted, do you have a question? Unmute, please. I, I was just enjoying your presentation so much, and I was having sort of an epiphany uh, a little bit, and I had my hands up, but thank okay. you. Okay, all, right. <laughs> all right. Well, um, uh, that's fine. We'll move on then. So, uh, yeah, so the failure, uh, and, and it's sort of like, um, it's, it's, it's an unpleasant cocktail at the moment with, what I would call the neo Taylorist expert and plan driven operation. Now, it's about 30 years here that the Berlin Wall came down and the Eastern Bloc gave up on, on plan economy. But we're very well into trying to re-implement it under another label. And it's combined with hierarchical command management. And that has led to that we have a separation of planning and doing. There are those that plan and those that do. Also in knowledge work, we, uh, I mean, this 120 years ago, you can understand Winslow Taylor that he came up with the concept because he had totally uneducated staff that just could execute exactly what they were told to do. And he only had like a couple of hours to introduce the poor immigrants from Southern Italy or poor Scandinavia, Eastern Europe in working in the industry. So you could just give them very simple instruction, but this is actually 120 years ago. Layers in the command hierarchy are alienated from each other to a large extent. And I've, I've seen it in so many companies that I, I dare to draw a conclusion like that. And the consequence is, of course, that these big upfront planning systems fail systematically. And um, when it's a complex thing. Because obviously what we don't know, we can't plan for. We have a living proof here in the Danish public sector uh, implementing IT systems doesn't only fail always, they consistently fail always. 
um, because um, they are handled the planning way. The command hierarchy is too slow to react to sudden phase shifts in markets or technology. Of course, the coronavirus here, you can see how uh, strongly hierarchical uh, systems cannot react quickly because uh, nobody dares to take a decision. That was what Stanley McChrystal found out about the, the most expensive and well-planned army in the world, the US Army in Iraq. He couldn't cope with Al-Qaeda until he learned to, to, to react as quickly as they could move. And then people are increasingly being fed up with being patronized. And, um, and, and so companies, organizations have a massive loss of talent when this happens, because then people just give up and they leave. And with knowledge workers, it is so expensive when they leave because it takes such a long time to get them in and get them up to speed with what we're doing here. So it's a real, real loss. Um, the strange thing is, of course, that we, 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 um, we are not normally in great favor of um, totalitarian governments. But how come that we are so infatuated with it in business and that they are our role models uh, over and over again? That there's a, uh, one guy that I follow quite a lot. He uses the term expressive individualism. I, I, I express myself. I, I have the right to do whatever I please and greed. Greed is good. Michael Douglas said a while ago in, um, in, in the firm. Um, and, and it's promoted. Look how great this person is. He, he has so much money. And, and, and then it leads to overly competitiveness. Tanya McChrystal, he says, in the American army, you either move up or you move out. If you miss a promotion, it's a clear signal that you, you might as well seek your retirement because you ain't going to get anywhere here. So, it's, so we have to move up. And therefore, the fight for that higher position overrides our intrinsic motivation of doing what is, is good. So you don't have colleagues, you have competitors. And we'll get back to it in a moment. Why is this really fatal? Because that sort of attitude changes people's personality, which is scary, another scary fact. And because of this, we do not have teamwork when we have competitors, and we do not have rapid dissipation of information because it might be to my competitive advantage to hide it a little bit. And good old Deming, he said a long time ago, if your boss is the customer, who takes care of the real customer? Can I just ask that question, please? If, if your boss is the one you're focusing on, you have to please him because he has his destiny in your hands. Obviously, you're going to do that. But then who takes care of the real customer? And fear often becomes a, an instrument of management. One of the things that Deming also said, I think it's in a quote a little bit later, but, but he said with his deep voice, he says, if there is fear in an organization, the numbers are cooked. Yeah, people will do whatever to make the numbers they've been... So um, if you can go to an agile lean organization, what can it give you? Um, we're talking about a resilient organization. A lot of it is based on Deming's ideas, plan, do, study, act, the constant learning circle. If you do that, you can get a strength and focus on the customer. This was the actually Deming's prime thing when you read his memoirs and everything, he said, the best thing I did in, in Japan was I drew a simple back sort of feedback loop from the customer all the way back to design. Involve the customer always. Now, he was a mathematician or statistic, worked with statistics, and he's mostly known for that and his, uh, his statistic analysis and, and, and so on. But, and, but actually, it was the customer focus that was the real thing. We can get an engaged individual, more social capital, um, because people will, will engage themselves when they are allowed to. And that can give much higher yields because it's efficient. When people trust each other, there are much less transaction costs and monitoring costs because we can trust each other. We, we, we keep our commitments. The core tenets of self-management is no one can coerce anybody else to do something. You can't use force against other people. 
And the second thing, you keep your commitments. That builds trust and then productivity goes up. Since everybody's committed to quality, it goes up. Stakeholders are more happy. That's what it all matters, really. That is where it really matters. And, and we have much greater resilience in times of change uh, because people are willing to uh, take on additional role behavior. We see goals, progress, and impediments because we are willing to be radically transparent. And um, because we work in a way that allow us to spend time on common understanding and alignment, we get more effective solutions and minimizing the risk. Employees, we can, there, there's, there's some great studies on this also. Uh, employees are more satisfied. Um, and if they can work in a smaller team setting where there's proximity to other people, um, that, that really matters a lot to them. Uh, the greater autonomy, they can see the value of what they're doing and they, can, they have autonomy to decide something about how they're doing. They're not being micromanaged. And the constant learning improvement process allow them to, um, to, 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 to be good at what they're doing. Another statement from Edward Deming was, allow people pride of workmanship, he said. He said that in, in, in sort of opposition to the assembly line, which he said, this is dehumanizing. They, they do not enjoy just putting one screw in and, and, and pushing the item further. You have to create jobs that are of a certain size that allows people to see a result of their hands work and, and allow them pride of workmanship. And the disciplined leadership that we are uh, advocating here fosters psychological safety that enables these things. Psychological safety, we'll get back to it, quoting Amy Edmondson from Harvard, uh, Professor Amy Edmondson, uh, one of the key people in this, uh, around this area here. And, and, and it's clearly documented that if you have psychological safety in your work, you have less stress and sick leave, you stay longer, and you're willing to take on more and alternative responsibility than what you originally were employed for. So psychological safety is another angle to look at this, the same thing. So um, let's, let's now try and see what is the difference. And uh, uh, let, let me give you a, and I'll get back to some of the, the fatal things a little bit later, but this slide here is about what is the difference? What is it actually we are proposing? And when I say we, it's a collection of primarily Scandinavian, but also Central European uh, tra uh, agile trainers and coaches that have tried to come up with this idea about the agile lean leadership or the agile lean organization. How should it be put together if we want to scale agility all the way out in, um, in the whole organization? Not just one team, not just one project, not just the product development, but let it permeate the organization. All right, here's the hierarchy. We know that. There's a man in the top, there's some purple people in the middle, and there's the gray matter down at the bottom where the work is done. And what goes down are commands and resources and control, and what goes up are reports and deliverables. The hierarchy is here for compliance and predictability. Make no mistake of that. It's always been like that. It was has been like that ever since 1841. There was a major train crash in Western Massachusetts on the Worcester Albany line. Two trains rammed together, big disaster. People were killed. Commission was set up and, um, the, in, and the guy in charge was Major Whistler from the army, as you can hear. And he concluded that every organization has to be organized like this with very clear lines of responsibility and who takes orders from who and who, who monitors who. Because, as he said, then you can always find the guilty party, the culprit, where there is dereliction of duty. And in his mind, the only reason for something going wrong was somebody didn't do what they were told. And he took this straight out of the Prussian army, the traditional enemies of the Danes, by the way. Uh, and uh, they were the most well-organized army at the time. And it has been with us ever since. And it's still the case today that compliance and predictability is what the hierarchy gives. 
Now, it's of course not an evil thing in itself to have compliance and predictability. It makes things very stable. But it also makes things incredibly unmaneuverable because it becomes rigid. And of course, it, 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 can't, it can't move because it was designed to be predictable and compliant to plan. So what is it that we propose? Well, we want, following Stanley McChrystal's uh, idea, more or less, we want a network of team and circles. So, so instead of the hierarchy, we have organizations in teams. And to generalize a little bit, I use the term circles. And we start with our customers. This is the good old fashioned lean way. So when we look at our customers, they go, so who are they and what do they want? And uh, we try to describe them as best as we can. Uh, on, we, we make a manifest for these customers that they want this, they want that, etc. Then we start thinking of our organization and we um, create some teams or some circles that are designed to solve this customer's problems in the best possible way we can. Ned Flegging from Germany, he calls, them, he calls them cells and he says they are on the periphery of the organization because they touch the real world outside. And, and each of these circles here are organized almost like it's a generalized scrum team. There's a blue guy who has a role similar to the product owner. There's a green guy who has a role similar to the scrum master. And there are a bunch of yellow guys who have all the competences to solve whatever it is our customers need. And so in this case here, um, A will require some stuff from C and sometimes from D as well, and B will only require something from D. And they, of course, have matching competences. Now, sometimes you might want to, uh, you, you come to the conclusion that you would probably be better off if you had a circle behind the scenes that could do specific things um, it, because you can't you can't fit everything into one small team. Now there's a compromise here. It's not black and white because you want a small team, so people you get all the values of the small team we know. But sometimes the job is bigger and more competences are needed. And one way of dealing with it is scaling out, that is backwards here, into having a team, a circle in the center, and they deliver to um, uh, E delivers to C and D. And sometimes we include our suppliers as well. We're not entirely happy with this because this are, these are handovers and we know that every handover, there's a risk of misunderstanding. But the alternative is scaling up and having multiple teams inside a circle. And uh, yeah, that's, we can have a long discussion about that, but not now. But these are the two things you have to think about. This is the value stream. Those of you who work with Lean recognize this is actually the value stream. We also call them the primary circles. And when you have these circles, you, as soon as you have more than one circle, you have a need for coordination. And, and of course, we, we recommend that people do um, uh, sort of uh, bilateral coordination as much as possible. Sometimes you need, you need to have um, a tactical solution of issues. So C and D, they need to use the company truck. And C says, when are you guys at D done with it? We need to use it as well. And... Uh, and sometimes it makes sense to have a coordinating meeting. Um, this was called Scrum of Scrums in the old days, the tactical resolution. So one, the team members meet and coordinate across the teams. And sometimes we have a strategic resolution where there's a, a, either a disagreement between the teams about what should be done first, etc. Maybe C wants something done first and D thinks, no, we should come first. We have more money riding on this. And then they say, okay, let's time out, time out. Let's escalate and move it up to the strategic resolution circle where those guys that are the product owners in the value stream in the primary circles, they meet up here and they say, let's behave like grown-ups and see what's best for all of us. And then they make a decision on that and everybody can then be happy about that. And of course, in the same way, we have an operational resolution uh, where those that have roles similar to the Scrum Master meet and discuss organizational matters. What is the impediments? How can we remove them? How can we improve, etc. We call these the level two circles because they have authority above the single circles. Because otherwise, the single circles could just be satisfied with themselves and create a new kind of silo comparable to what we have before. 
So what goes up here are issues and ideas and escalation, what goes down and resolution, delegation and investment. Um, and um, we're almost done, but there is one thing that was good over in the hierarchy, and that was that people were typically in functional groups in the same departments, and they could talk to people of the same uh, persuasion or, or competencies. Here, we call those secondary circles or communities of interest, or those of you who've read about Spotify, uh, perhaps recognize the term guilds, and they are people with um, same uh, competences and they meet occasionally to discuss cross-cutting concerns about special areas of competences that we have. Um, and it also happens if we have a sudden drop into chaos that we make what we call a transient circle of, um, of, of, of highly skilled people that can deal with sudden drops into chaos and stabilize it. And we've given them the authority to try and stabilize very quickly. And then they disband again, and that's why it's transient. But the secondary circles are important, the community of interest or guilds, because that's what ties the whole thing together from a knowledge point of view. So what goes right in this here, in this uh, illustration are, are request and delegation, what goes left are fulfillment and delivery, the pull principle. And the whole thing is designed to serve the customer, always optimizing. This is what we sometimes call the road less traveled, in which we strongly urge people to, tr to, to try a trip on this road. Uh, the road less traveled and um, and get to, get to a structure like this. And this is what we work with to try and educate people. We have a training program, we have um, uh, coaching services and, and, and tools to support this. Now, this is in many ways the sort of the key idea and it's called very brief, uh, brief introduction here, uh, just um, a few minutes for it. So there's lots and lots of detail in how to do this, but there are good templates to be followed. There are good, uh, practices to learn from and we can we can do that let's just move back a little bit and say so why did i call the attraction fatal um, well there are a couple of things to say here what one thing is um power corrupts <laughs> uh, to 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 accumulate power um apparently the human being is not really capable of handling that I think it was President Lincoln who said, uh, anyone, can ha anyone can handle um, sort of um, problems in his life, but if you really want to see what the person is made of, try and give him power, then you'll see what he's really like. Um, Lord Acton, he said in 1887, the power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Dr. Kirkpatrick, he writes an article about uh, where he shows that actually you, it, it is documented that when you execute power over other, other people, you get a dopamine surge in your brain and, and, and you get high on it. it. It Scarily, it resembles the effect of cocaine. So short term euphoria, oh great, I told this person to jump and they did jump and so on. <coughs> but you can get addicted to it. And it can also lead to arrogance, impatience, etc. And there's um, another kind of corruption that is demonstrated <coughs> by psychologist Dacher Keltner, and it's called the Cookie Monster Experiment. He brought in people, a few people, three or four, something like that, and gave them an, a, a job to do uh, to um, make some written assignments and. Um, and then he, um, he, he, he pronounced one of them to be the leader. Okay. And then um, uh, a few, uh, fifth, five minutes into the job or so, <coughs> they served them refreshments and uh, freshly baked cookies. And there was one cookie more than there were people in the team. So everybody took a cookie, of course, and then there was one left. And in most of the cases, the one who was pronounced the leader felt that he or she had the entitlement to take the last cookie. No questions asked. That's scary, isn't it? Just because then I, I can take what I like 
And you can see the consequences of that in that if that runs wild. Power linked with status and money. That's, that's a lethal cocktail because these are the most powerful extrinsic motivators we have. If there's money on the table, we cannot resist it. None of us can say we can completely, we are primed to react to that. And then the focus becomes the hierarchy and we compete for space. Whenever there's extrinsic motivation, it overrides intrinsic, my internal motivation. And there's a, an, <clears throat> there's a moment and a measure of fear when we have this, when we're dominated by extrinsic. So we lose psychological safety and consequently learning. If we, if we push people to comply with numbers, etc., they will comply. They will also distort data and systems to make it work for them. So extrinsic motivation is a double-edged sword to use. And the status of the hierarchy it, combined with money, and, and today is really visible. I mean, have you seen the development in how much the higher echelons in the hierarchy make in terms of money compared to the lower ones? In the American banking system, I think there's about, it's about a factor of 50, five zero, larger than it was in the 20s. And we think back to the 20s as sort of a crude period with robber barons, etc. No, today there's a much, much bigger. And therefore it's, it's, it's really powerful, really powerful. People get sucked into it. None of us can think. So what's the alternative? Well, empathy, gratitude, and generosity. That's why, okay, we have authority. And, and I'm not saying that we should be romantic about it and have no authority and to just go back to the communes and the hippie culture of the 70s. That's not my argument. We have authority. But if you are in a, in a position of authority, you have to work with consequently showing empathy, gratitude, and generosity. Um, the psychologist Dacher Keltner that I quoted before, he has collected it this way, so this is more or less stolen directly from him. What can you do to practice empathy? Ask questions, paraphrase what others say so that they feel understood. Um, make sure that the person has your full attention. Um, show that you listen, don't rush to judgment. And um, yeah. Think about the person that you are talking to. David, do you want to say something? No, no, he, no you don't. All right. The next one, gratitude. What can you do? Yeah, make sure that you, you communicate and say thank you to, to, to people. And of course, it's not going to be a show here you, because that will be revealed immediately if you're dishonest about it and just putting on a facade. But there are things to be thankful for that people have done. They've actually done an extra thing for you. Make sure that your colleagues know it. Acknowledge the value of the people. Uh, the last session was about Scrum Masters and how they behave in various situations. One of the great things Scrum Masters can do is show the path for other people that actually uh, approving, show appreciation of what other people have done. For example, during retrospective. Make sure that that's a habit. Um, and generosity, yeah, spend time, give from your time when people need it. Um, make sure that um, those things that you could let other people do and be proud of they did it, give it to them. And um, the, the last one here, and uh, which he called Share the Limelight, uh, one of the people I met once that, that had that changed profoundly, really, one of the reasons was that she had a boss that shared the limelight with her, gave her part of the credit, but on one special occasion where she had actually made a mistake, that guy stepped in and took responsibility and, uh, and, 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 and shared the blame also. So generosity is giving of yourself to other people. That can, to some extent, keep you away from being lured into the into the 
into the um, uh, into the, the, the search for proposition in the hierarchy. So you want to be a gardener of an organization, and we're going to quote these people here. Um, uh, Stanley McChrystal, he says in his, his book that um, uh, he was about 50 years old when he was sent to Iraq and he said, I had to change completely. I had to think, so stop thinking of myself as the chess master, moving the pieces around and position everyone on the battlefield to the gardener, preparing the soil for people to self-develop. And, and so the first thing that you should, the plant you should try to cultivate in your garden the organization is high psychological safety that enables learning. Read Amy Edmondson's book, especially the last one where I think she sums it up nicely. It's called The Fearless Organization. Great book. And um, what is psychological safety? A lot of things, but at least Amy Edmondson says it is. No one gets punished for admitting a mistake. No one gets punished for asking for help. No one gets punished for suggesting a better way of doing things. And that is the basis for that you actually dare to speak up and you dare to, to experiment and you dare to try something out because you might not succeed in it. And, and the failure is not a condemning act, but it's an opportunity for learning. Psychological safety is the basis for working together in the complex domain. Because we need experiments in the complex domain. Remember, we only have some of the pieces of the puzzle, but we have to do something anyway. This is, by the way, another argument for why you need teams in the complex domain. Because we, if, we, if we're about to solve a complex problem together and, um, and, and, and we're a team, then we bring, bring our different perspectives to the table, our different sets of pieces of the puzzle and we are able to stitch it together and get a more complete picture and a better solution uh, to whatever it is uh, that we are solving. But we must have psychological safety, otherwise no one dares to experiment. It's always safe. In fact, in a bureaucracy, it is actually safer to do nothing. So if in doubt in a bureaucracy, don't do anything because you stand the risk of being punished if you do something, you probably not stand any risk if you don't do anything. So psychological safety is there. Trust-based shared goals and values. Robert Putnam is a, a, psych, a sociologist and, and, um, and he talks about how if we, if we trust each other, that is because we have a prolonged experience of trustworthiness that we keep our commitments. I'm sorry to say it doesn't happen overnight. It takes, and, and, the, and I can testify to you that the older you get, it actually takes longer than it did some years ago to trust people because you, you tend to remember all the bad experiences, but it takes time. But he calls that social capital. And he said, what is social capital? And Robert Putnam, he says, it's informal shared norms and values that promote cohesion and trust that will go well beyond what is required by the law, talking about society here, or if you look inside organizations by, by the formal rules and regulations or whatever standards we have. But it, they are informal shared norms and values, and that allows us to cooperate and to uh, way beyond what, what is required. He gives an example of a community in New York City of highly um, uh, of Orthodox Jews that uh, have uh, a, a, a highly efficient market for diamonds. And because of those shared values in that closed community, I'm sure there are also negative aspects of a pretty close community, but one of the things is that they trust each other and therefore the transaction costs whenever they trade are very, very low because they don't need to monitor and they don't need an awful lot, of, they don't need a couple of lawyers on each side before a transaction can be completed. If we trust each other's transaction costs get very low and we get very, very high efficiency. So trust is at the core of this. We need to build organizations where trust can flourish. 
extreme efficiency. And then intrinsic motivation, and there I call on our one, another one of our heroes, Anders Duschwig from Oslo, a professor at the business school there, and he has written a number of um, uh, scholarly articles about intrinsic motivation. Uh, for now, I'll just point in the direction that what he concludes together with Daniel Pink is everybody needs to see a purpose. I experience working for a higher goal than just myself. I have autonomy. I have high influence on my work situation. I, um, I'm not just a little cogwheel. Uh, you remember perhaps Chaplin's modern times with the little uh, vagabond get caught in the big machine and travels around in the cogwheels. Uh, nobody wants to feel like that. And then mastery. I can grow. I can be good at what I'm doing. This is what we have to foster. And if we get intrinsic motivation, then we get all the benefits we talked about before with improved uh, engagement, staying longer, less sick leave, less stress, willingness to take on extra responsibility, etc. Yeah, so we're coming to the end now. Um, so um, to sum it up, uh, I've talked about, I've used the term agile in leadership, which is our concept that we, have tried to develop and we are in currently inviting people to join us in the network for further development of this. How can we come up with a way where we can help organizations generally scaling out, getting more out of their efforts? And um, and and it's it's we've we've sort of boiled it down to um, a set of four values inspired by Scrum and Lean, a set of principle, set of 16 principles to follow derived from yeah, lean thinking, some of from Scrum, Agile Manifesto, or some of W. Edwards Deming's 14 points, um, and then a, a set of constraints and patterns and methods we can, we can follow. We're in the, in the middle of trying to, to, to document this as, uh, in, in the language of patterns to see if we can describe that uh, so that there are some very, very practical recommendations of how to do it, how to, how to structure it, and also how to get there, how to introduce it. And, um, and, and, and all this stuff about the hierarchy and the other kind of the organization we are talking about, um, I, I have to say that the, the more I've worked with this over the last, well, three years perhaps really, because before I, when I started to uh, think about, write about uh, the hierarchy, the more I'm convinced we really have to abolish the hierarchy. It just is a fatal attraction. Uh, but we have to show the people in the hierarchy who are, of course, not, they're not evil. <laughs> they're not evil and, they're, and they should be given a way forward. So where, where are they going to be? We have to get our organizations to allocate prestige and value and money to those position in the agile uh, uh, organization. Because as long as it, the, the money and the prestige and the position is coupled to the up and down of the hierarchy, then you ain't gonna get people to move. In Norway, we have one of our great customers, Telenor, a big telecommunications company, and they have a big hierarchy about seven layers. And um, the, the boys and girls at the bottom, they really want to be agile. The lady at the top, she also wants to be it. We can read about that every second day in the newspaper, how agile they want to be. And, but those in the middle, they don't want to be it because they're scared. What's gonna to happen to us? And they have a special term for that in Norway. Well, actually in Telenor, and it's all semi-public, so I don't really do any damage by revealing it. That layer of middle management is called the permafrost. It's because it ain't moving. Nothing ever gets through there. And, um, and, and that's what we have to show to these people that there is also benefits for them in this. And um, I'm gonna rest my case with this. Uh, you, can, you can ask to get the slides from me. Uh, and you can, of course, you can see the links uh, in, in the video if you see it afterwards. Um, but um, right now, uh, what we 
first of all, I'd like to, there's, there's a set of articles on this that they're all on LinkedIn and um, you can go and uh, have fun with those later on. But I think for now, as you can see, we're heading up for times of closure and, and Sherry is looking more and more restless. So uh, um, we'll, we'll probably end with that. Let me just end with this picture here. Um, it is broken. Sorry, guys. I wouldn't undertake to repair that wheel, but let's help you help you make, build a new one. Here are my contact details if you want to uh, have the information or, or, or further discussions. Um, awesome. Right?